lovely to be back. Um, it's just a shame that it's so cold today. <laughs> but it's, it's lovely to be here with you. Um, I, the last time I was here, uh, I was just very uh, struck by that I, I felt like this is home. Uh, and that it's a, it has, you quickly give that feeling uh, to people, I think, when they come in here, that it feels like a safe space to come into and it feels homely. So thank you very much. And thank you also for your support of Envoy, the work that I do uh, through Church Army. So let's pray. Father, as we can hear the wind through the open door, uh, may we hear the wind of your spirit. Uh, may you speak uh, to us in a way that lifts us up uh, into your presence and out from you into the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, so this is here, uh, so that you can tell me when it's time to stop preaching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't really. Uh, it's, does anyone know what this is called? Hourglass. An hourglass, yes. I looked up thinking it must have a really fancy name, but it doesn't. Uh, and apparently it was originally made uh, for ships uh, and that every 30 minutes uh, that the sand would run through they would ring a bell, turn it around and on the second one they would ring two, three, four, five until eight and then the watchman would swap uh, duty and the next person would come on duty to watch. So that's where this comes from, that wouldn't work for me because of three, I wouldn't remember if I'd already done two, three, or four. Um, but that is where it comes from. Um, the other way now that we measure time uh, is this. And this measures time very differently to this. Because this has no gravity at work at all. But that is working because of gravity. So this one is more like the squares on a graph paper. And every square is identically the same and each one has the same weight, value, worth as all the others. That's not how that measures time. That measures time where there's lots of it or there's little of it. So whenever that comes close to the end, um, it, you know it's coming close to the end and you can feel it in your body. Uh, I have one of these at work which I use uh, so that it, I so easily get absorbed in the wrong emails or whatever uh, and so I use that. Because whenever I say that, oh, well, this is getting really close and I've spent too long on this, I feel like I rush uh, to get through the rest of the work. But I actually think this is a healthier view of time. Because we do have days where we have a lot of it and we should work differently in those days than on the days where we do not have a lot of it. Uh, that is a different kind of work that we do. Uh, the reason I want to talk about time today is because Jesus actually talked about it in the parable that he told. And at the opening of the parable, uh, we gather that he's about to give us an example of something. So I went back and I discovered, oh, this is the second example of something, and had to go back uh, a chapter earlier to find out why did he need to give an example. And the disciples and he were in the temple precincts, and the disciples had said, isn't this place incredible? Uh, and they were speaking from the perspective of, this has always been here, it probably always will be here. So their approach to time was, well, it's always there. So Jesus then tells them something to say, no, it won't always be there. In Matthew 24, he says, be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour you do not expect. He then, in verse 45, uh, pulls that down into them and what the implications of that are for them. Who then is the faithful and the wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the household to give them their food at the proper time? Jesus is saying three things. Time is limited and it's finite. Number two, that uh, the thing that's required, if you've got this much time, 
there are two attributes that he thinks are probably the best ones to put in there, and it's faithfulness and wisdom. And the word for faithfulness is a bit like, the only way I can describe it is what happens to me when I go to the garage to get my car serviced. And there's a bank of mechanics. I know the one that I want to work on my car. Uh, and I know the ones that I don't want to work on my car. And that's because I have spotted faithfulness. Faithfulness is the life experience gained uh, through the practice of faith, through the practice of expertise. And the experience then feeds back into more faith and more expertise. So that's what faithfulness means. The word for wise or wisdom in that passage actually is the same word for diaphragm. It's something that's internal, that regulates consistently and always behind the scenes, inside, that actually sets the other organs to work really. The diaphragm moving invisibly behind the scenes. So Jesus is saying, I'm looking for people who are willing to get a bit of life experience behind them with faith and actually have an in inner working of wisdom going on. And then he says, the last one is why all this? Why is it important to know when he's coming back? Why is it important to live in the time that we have with faithfulness and wisdom? And he, it's very basic. And I know it's, it's just an example that he's giving. But he says that the wise servant provides food for the household and he gives them their food at the proper time. Those of you who are guardians or parents or grandparents will know the importance of, uh, of getting the food on the table, otherwise hungry people uh, show up. And because you've been out of time, uh, and suddenly they're all over the place, and even half an hour out, and a little child will look like they're bouncing off the walls. So we know the importance of time. Two things about time. Time has cost and consequence built into it. When it looks like there's lots of it, it's very easy to just get quite laid back about it um, and really not pay much attention to it. But this kind of time that we see right now, it's really good. It's really good to get stuck in, to press in, uh, to concentrate, almost to go into blinker vision and really get our hands into whatever it is that we're doing. That's what this kind of time is for. But when that runs down and you see the last grains of sand and you see the little, little hole beginning to appear, it's too late to get your hands stuck in. It's too late to think. You know that panic moment for anyone who's been to university, that panic moment of the deadline and you think, I can, I can pull this off in two hours. Uh, and really, you, can, well, you may get away with it, but you haven't really pulled it off. Uh, that time is about stopping. That time is about finishing. That time is about resting. Time is not the same in, at different moments. <clears throat> this servant that we, we heard read about today, there are three servants, and the third one seems to be living as though there is no cost and no consequence at all. Matthew 24, as I've already hinted at, says the wise servant feeds the others in the household. I get the impression that Jesus is painting the picture to his disciples that this third servant actually was probably well fed because the one who had the five bags of gold actually looked after everybody else. And so he didn't really need to get stuck in. He didn't really need to work because someone else was doing it. That is very tempting. It's tempting to say, it's not my job. It's tempting to say, oh, I did, I've done that before. It's tempting to have a lot of reasons where the cost and the consequence shifts from me to someone else. But if too much cost and consequence go to too few people, the cost is too much and the consequences are too high. So how do we do this? Time is finite. So let's make the most of it and let's get stuck in. We can't be neutral, we can't be passive, we just only get to decide who will pay the cost and what will the consequence be because there always is cost 
and there always is consequence. Yesterday morning, a very simple story, uh, I got up and I'm part of a mission community, so we're all adults within uh, the household that I'm in, part of a bigger mission community in the area, and we have discovered that there's no point doing mission where we live during the winter, because no one comes out of their house. So we do it in the summertime and on Saturdays. So yesterday morning, I got up to go and set up for our dads and children's group in the hall. I came downstairs and I saw a bit of paper on the side. I thought, I'm gonna grab a coffee and go. And the note said, the milk's off. I wasn't clothed, so I didn't get any. And so I thought, oh well, I'll just go and set up. So I went, came back four hours later and came into the kitchen and there was a note on the side. Uh, the milk's off. I wasn't dressed, so I didn't get any. I opened up the fridge just to check if someone had got milk and they were right, the milk was off and there was no fresh milk for coffee. So I went out to do my next event and so people have been coming and going all morning in the house. So when I got home from the second event, everyone was home and there was what we call a council of war over the milk. <laughs> uh, and it usually tends to be the milk that is the council of war. And the reason it was, was that actually, the truth is, all of us, we would have liked the milk, but we had no real need of the milk. And so we passed the cost and the consequence further down the line. But we all did it. Except for one person, Debbie. Debbie's highest priority in life is community. She values it above everything else. So Debbie's the one who will walk back down the hallway to close the door. She's the one who will go back into the kitchen to switch off the lights. Uh, she is the one who may not need milk, but spots that there's milk needed, who will go across the road to the shop. I timed it because I knew I wanted to include it. It's 40 seconds from our door to the shop door. Uh, so any one of us could really have gone to get milk uh, for the household. But the problem is, because she values it so highly, she will do it, and the rest of us will let her do it. But there's a cost and there's a consequence that we were not sharing, but we were letting her hold. There's nothing passive in the kingdom of God. There's nothing neutral in the kingdom of God. There is cost and there's consequence. So where is it going to land? Time is also past, present and future. I presume that's all about because it's going there. Uh, past time. I was talking to someone recently and they said, that their organisation looks back to the past with sort of a rosy view of the past and a very romantic view of the past. And I thought, well, I suppose any of us who look back on our church life or on our organisation life, we tend to look back in two ways, romantically or traumatically. And I thought, if I have to choose between trauma and romance, I'll choose romance. So the church's past, our own past, it is good to look back on it. It's good to learn from it, it's good to celebrate it, it's good to retell the story of it. But we cannot go back there, and nor can we bring it to us. That is not our best place of investment with our bags of gold. The future, it doesn't exist yet, but it will. And it could be a source of fear for us. We fear who isn't here. We fear will we have enough money. We fear a list of things that cast shadows into our day to day. But as I said, it doesn't exist yet. So that means, in terms of time, the only time that's really powerful and is full of potential is this moment. It's today. That's the only one that I've actually got to do something with. How I live this moment is probably a really good reflection of how I lived yesterday. It's also a good sign of how I'm probably going to live tomorrow. I am a rubbish timekeeper, but it's actually my choice. I know I say that it isn't my choice, it just sort of acts I'm sorry, it keeps happening. But really, the choices that I make keep lending themselves to being a really bad timekeeper. Uh, so I did well to be here. Uh, so the choices and the consequences boil down today. So what am I going to do with it? Because if I can spend my gold today, if I can practice the experience that I've got 
and the wisdom that I've got today, and I can make a tweak, and I can change something, the chances are that the cost tomorrow will go down a little bit, and the chances are that the consequences tomorrow are a little bit better. But that comes down to today. Let's look at the sermon. He had two days that we hear about. So day number one, he's got a bag of gold. Fantastic. What does he do with his bag of gold? He goes and he buries it. If, like the first two sermons, he had actually invested, even with a banker, Ephesians 4, the epistle reading that we had today, says what would have happened. There would have been an increase of love. There would have been an increase of unity. And there would have been an increase of maturity. Ephesians 4 says those three things come when the gifts are practiced. Love, maturity, and just that whole sense of togetherness with one another. So how do you and I invest today? What is the gold that is in all saints? Now I have only been here uh, twice before. Uh, I've improved, I've gone from flops to shoes. Um, I think you can understand me a little bit better and try really hard to slow down. So I'm learning my lessons as I come here every time. But what is your goal? I'm going to tell you what I think some of your goal is. Because I work for a charity, I have to fill in, fill in lots of fundraising applications to grants agencies. And the two things that if I were to mention them, I, I would get money without any difficulty. Youth and deprivation. And those are good things to invest our time in as Christians. But lots of churches I, I visit, often what they want is to be younger. Uh, they want younger families or they want a youth group. They would love those things and those are really good things to aspire to. But if that is not the goal you've already got, then you're investing in something that doesn't actually exist. But I'll come back to that in a second. So what is your goal that I see? The first thing that came to mind was your hospitality. And I don't mean the coffee and the tea. I mean what happens over the coffee and tea when I've been here. Uh, I've heard so much laughter. Uh, and at, at times jokes that have been uh, personal would actually have been very good personal. Uh, and people join in and people laugh together. Hospitality is one of your pieces of gold. It's fantastic here. I think I also spotted celebration because I heard people tell stories in, in the hall um, and I suspected that those stories had been told before and I suspected the person listening knew the stories but actually what they were doing was celebrating. They were celebrating each other, uh, they were celebrating what it is to be all saints. That is one of your bits of gold. Lots of people can't celebrate, you're really good at it. So it is your goal. I suspect, and this is guesswork, I suspect whether as a congregation or as individuals, you've had hardships and you've had difficulties and you've learned your way out of them uh, and you've brought them with you in a new way and you hold life differently. That is gold. Lots of people can't do that, but I suspect in this church, just in contact with you, that you do that well. I also think you're hands-on, and this is where it draws it together, but the first visit, I think I helped pull out a, a, a holly tree root, and the laughter that was going on, uh, and the, the tea that was available, and the stories being told were fantastic. Your church is gold, and you have a bag of gold. So given that that's the gold, and I suspect there's more, how will you invest in that? Day two, the second day that this servant knew. This servant, when the master showed up, was eloquent. He had the gift of the gab, much like Irish people, but he had the gift of the gab. And I suspect when people do not invest in their gold, what they invest in with respect is their mouth. We get good at excuses. We get good at just telling things, blaming, reciting, rehearsing, Let's just get stuck in. This servant literally lost touch with his gold. He literally lost touch with what God had given to him. 
And it doesn't even say that he dug it up and gave it back to the master. It feels more like that they took the master to the field and said, um, it's, I think it's over there somewhere. There's such disregard for what the Lord had already given. And I said I would come back to something. Um, I'm hoping you do long for more people in church, younger people, young families. I'm hoping you long for that. Because the servant who had been given five bags and now had become ten bags, got a shock. He got a bag of gold that he hadn't planned on, that he hadn't asked for, that he hadn't invested in. It just showed up. And I suspect if any church is willing to invest in the gold it already has, other gold will show up at its door. And it will be the Lord saying, you are a faithful and a good servant. Thank you. Would you take this gold and will you invest in it in the way that I have watched you invest in the gold I've already given you? And I suspect all saints, because of what I've experienced, as a church that would say yes. And that the Lord would take great delight that he would have brought to you people that maybe you hadn't expected or maybe that you'd longed for. But I think it's in you. But it all depends how we use our time. Not tomorrow, not going back to yesterday, but today. What is the commitment of today? Is it faithful? Is it wise? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that our time has not run out. Forgive us for the times that we think we are living with less or with lack, when already we are rich with the gold we are and the gold that you have given. Help us to commit. Help us to share the cost and the consequence. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be wise. And Lord, we are ready for that extra bag of gold when it shows up at this church door. In Jesus' name we pray.